Good afternoon, everyone. This is Dr. Val Arkush, Chair of the Montgomery County Board of Commissioners. I'm joined today uh, by my colleague, Commissioner Ken Lawrence. Today is April the 14th, 2021. <clears throat> we are in week 58 of the COVID-19 pandemic here in Montgomery County. I'm gonna start with some updates on the Johnson & Johnson vaccine. Per federal and state directives, the Montgomery County Office of Public Health has paused the use of the Johnson & Johnson COVID-19 vaccine at our vaccine clinics yesterday and today. Anyone who had an appointment to receive the J&J &J vaccine with us has been contacted and given the opportunity to reschedule their appointment for a later date. We've taken inventory of all of our remaining first doses of Pfizer vaccine and have updated our clinic schedule accordingly to only distribute Pfizer through next Tuesday, April the 20th. Today, the CDC will convene a meeting of the Advisory Committee on Immunization Practices to further review the cases in question and assess their potential significance. We will await further guidance on this matter. Taking a pause to evaluate a potential side effect is exactly how a data-driven scientific process should work. And I hope that Pennsylvanians will be reassured by this step. We have to balance speed and safety as we try to get more shots into arms. And this pause gives me confidence that science and safety are guiding this process. Now I wanna share uh, where we are with vaccine scheduling. Our vaccine clinics continue to offer appointments through the end of the month. Anyone who books with us will have the ability to choose their clinic location, the date and time of their appointment, and even the vaccine that they receive, assuming that uh, we have more than the one choice of the Pfizer, which is the case today. Until further notice, we will only distribute Pfizer, uh, and we'll just have to see how that plays out over the next week or so. As a reminder, if you or a family member have any appointment issues, please email COVID19 at montcopa.org, or you can call our hotline at 833-875-3967. Now that vaccine appointment eligibility is open to all, anyone can register with us to receive the vaccine. We are currently sending appointments to people who qualify for phase 1A, 1B, and 1C. To ensure equitable access for all as we continue our rollout, vaccine appointments within each phase will be released randomly, not by the date registered. If you're trying to register and you experience longer than normal wait times on the COVID-19 hotline or website, don't get discouraged, just come back and register at a later time. As I said before, eligibility does not equal availability, and we will continue to release appointments based on our vaccine supply. I also wanna take a moment to address something we have seen over the last few weeks at our clinics and ask our community's help to resolve this. The issue is hostility towards our vaccine clinic staff. It is never acceptable to yell, berate, or otherwise harass our clinic staff. While many of our staff are county employees, some are contracted workers, and many are volunteers. But no matter, no matter how they get to our clinics, it is never acceptable to yell, berate, or harass them. We know the last few months have taken a toll on everyone waiting to receive the vaccine. I also recognize that there have been technical problems that have led to appointment glitches at some of our sites. But I ask that our community continue to have patience and be respectful of our clinic staff who are doing everything they can to keep this process safe and smooth for everyone. We are working as fast as we can to get more people vaccinated. We understand the deep desire shared by all of us to return to some kind of normalcy we want to provide shots in arms as quickly, efficiently, and as safely as we can. And we are accelerating the pace of vaccinations despite this week's setback. Please remember, we are all in this together and we need everyone's cooperation, respect, and understanding as we continue our vaccine rollout. 
We continue to expand our clinic locations. However, this week's J&J &J announcement has reduced the amount of vaccine appointments available over the next week. I'm happy to share that we will be able to maintain operations at our five weekday clinics with our Pfizer supply, and we're excited to have two clinics open this Saturday in Pottstown and Springhouse. As a reminder, you can register online or by phone to receive the vaccine through our COVID-19 hotline. And we'll put that number up here for you. To pre-register for the vaccine by phone, you can call the hotline at 833-875-3967 and let the agent know you need support in pre-registering for a vaccine appointment. Please note this service is prioritized for seniors and for those without internet access. We also want to remind residents that no cost transportation is available to all vaccine appointments in Montgomery County, uh, whether that's with a county site or any uh, of the retail pharmacy partners. There are currently three options through Transnet, SEPTA, and GoGo Grandparent for anyone who needs a ride to their vaccine appointments. We encourage anyone who needs transportation to call the numbers listed on the screen. Uh, the people, the uh, agents answering the hotline number can also share this information with you. As you know, we've been carefully, um, I'm sorry, as you know, we uh, present this weekly chart to give us a weekly update on how we're doing here in the county with our overall vaccination efforts. So let's walk through this chart. Uh, right now, starting in the upper left, we are accepting registrations from all phases. So anybody who's 16 years of age or older is welcome to register for a vaccine appointment. And we're scheduling appointments for phases 1A, 1B, and 1C. In terms of county administered vaccinations by our different clinics, you can see that at our community vaccine clinics, we've given over 63,000 first doses and over 38,000 second doses. Our first responder clinics have vaccinated uh, 2,600 people with first and uh, second doses. Our mobile clinic continues to be out just about every day of the week. And that team has vaccinated over 1,200 people with first doses and 438 with second doses. So in total, in our county run vaccination efforts, we are at 67,574 first doses and 41,334 second doses. You can see in the bottom left corner, uh, the manufacturer of each of the different types of vaccines that we have given here through the county. And then in the upper right corner, uh, some numbers that I think should make us all feel pretty good. I am going to start all the way over on the right side of that, that particular part of this chart and look at the percent of Montgomery County residents who are 65 years of age or older. We now have 48.93% of those individuals partially covered, 33.67% of those individuals fully covered, which means in total, we have 82.6% of our individuals 65 and older either partially or fully covered here in Montgomery County. So well, that is a number that makes me very, very pleased. When we look at those that are 16 and up, which is the entire currently eligible population of individuals, we are at 48.45% that are either partially or fully covered. And then when we look at that as a percent of our total population, and of course, this would include uh, children under the age of 16 who are not currently eligible to be vaccinated, we are at 39.25%. So we are making great progress as a county. Now, moving to the bottom right of this chart, as you know, we have been carefully tracking the race and ethnicity of the vaccinated population here in Montgomery County and comparing that data with census data for the racial and ethnic composition of our community. As you can see in the far right column, we are making steady improvement week over week in reaching all members of our community. For example, individuals that identify as African-American or Black make up 9.6% of our population, 
and 5.5% of the vaccinated population. This is an increase from 5.2% of the vaccinated population last week. We continue to ask people to please identify their race and ethnicity when they register for an appointment. You can see that we still have one in seven people who have chosen not to identify a race and one in four who have chosen not to identify an ethnicity. I want to just reiterate that we are using this data for only one purpose, and that is to make sure that we do not leave anyone behind in our efforts to vaccinate everyone in Montgomery County who wants to be vaccinated. Moving on to our regular update, since the April 7th press briefing, we have had 1,564 new cases of COVID-19 reported in Montgomery County for the dates inclusive of Wednesday, April the 7th through Tuesday, April the 13th. This is a daily average of 223.4 cases and brings us to a total of 54,014 cases. These positive cases are a result of a positive test for the virus, not from the antibody. Eight were from long-term care facilities, four were from other congregate settings, and 1,552 were from our community. These positive individuals are from 59 municipalities, but all 62 Montgomery County municipalities are home to individuals with COVID-19. Today's individuals range in age from five months old to 97 years old, and as always, you can see the county map on our data hub for more information. It can be found at www.macopa.org forward slash COVID-19. Today, we have 766 females, 793 males, and five unknown. I'm going to start adding an update on the variants that we've identified in this county to our regular briefing. Uh, so far to date, there have been 121 individuals identified with a variant. 110 of these are the B117 or the British or UK variant. Uh, that is the variant that is felt to be one and a half times more contagious than the original variant. And I do want to point out that not every single sample is being tested for the variant. In fact, it's a very, very small percentage of the samples that are being examined for the presence of a variant. And so the fact that we have 121 individuals identified would suggest that we have a very high percentage of our cases uh, from some of these more contagious variants. I am sorry to confirm that eight additional Montgomery County residents have lost their life to COVID-19, which brings us to a total of 1,274 deaths confirmed positive from COVID-19. These eight individuals ranged in age from 62 to 97 years old. Seven died in a hospital and one in a long-term care or other congregate setting. Uh, overall, we have lost 647 females, 627 males who've ranged in age from 25 to 106. In terms of the racial breakdown among individuals who have died from COVID-19, we have two that identified as American Indian or Alaska Native, 35 Asian, 9 Asian Indian, 6 Asian Korean, 152 African American or Black, 658 white and 412 unknown. At our Montgomery County Correctional Facility, the situation remains stable. Routine antigen testing is underway for all correctional officers, and we are in the process of offering vaccination to all inmates who wish to be vaccinated. Our positivity rate continues to increase. I'm sure that won't surprise you, given the numbers I shared with you. Uh, this is our uh, positivity graph that we show each week. Our 14-day average positivity rate is now 8.12% as of Thursday, April the 8th, compared with 7.13% as of Thursday, April the 1st. 
And you can see our graph in front of you. Uh, just as a reminder, the orange line are the number of daily PCR tests performed. And the blue line is that 14 day average uh, positivity rate, which of course you can see steadily rising. As a reminder, a positivity rate below 5% is considered suppression of the virus. And this next graph shows the daily positivity rates for March 12th through April the 8th. Um, you can see that the daily positivity fell below 5% on only three of the days in the last 28 days. And um, that purple line, which is the 14 day positivity rate is really taking a pretty steep climb up. Our hospitalizations are uh, also continuing to increase and, and remain fairly high. Since last Wednesday, uh, we now have 213 individuals uh, in a Montgomery County hospital with COVID-19. That's an increase from 206 last Wednesday. The good news is that 5% or 11 of these individuals are requiring a ventilator, which is unchanged from last week. But our hospitals do remain very busy. Uh, just as a reminder, and you can see it on this chart, Back uh, yeah, on October the 1st, there were only 24 patients hospitalized with COVID-19 in a Montgomery C County hospital. In terms of testing for the 14 day period ending April the 8th, 41,941 Montgomery County residents were tested for COVID-19, which is an increase of 1,137 people tested compared with the 14 day period ending on April the 1st. And this next graph shows you uh, the dates and then the number of people tested on each date as represented by those vertical gray bars. Uh, as a reminder, the red and pink are the seven day and 14 day average of all the cases in the county. The dark blue and light blue are the seven day and 14 day average of all cases in the community. And the orange and yellow lines down at the bottom are the seven and 14 day average from our long term care facilities. So you can just see the picture of what we've been through here since last spring. And then we can zoom in just on the last couple of months and you can see that we've had just kind of a slow, steady climb here over the last several weeks. So, again, just a reminder, there is still a lot of virus out there. Our case numbers are quite high. And uh, we must continue to be very, very careful. As always, we continue to have a good availability of testing and I want to urge anyone who wants or needs to be tested to please get tested. This is one of our strongest tools to help keep this virus under control. Our testing sites remain open Monday through fr Friday with varying hours each day at each site. To register for a test, you can go online at moncopa.org forward slash COVID-19. And at the top of the page, click under click on the heading that says COVID-19 testing. And appointments open up at 7 o'clock every day. Phone registration is available for all the sites. The phone number is 610-970. 2937 and phone registration opens at 830 in the morning. I also just want to remind everyone with, that with this high number of cases, uh, we are once again in a position where we will not be able to do full contact tracing on everyone. And so if you know that you've been exposed to COVID-19, you must self quarantine. If you would like to be tested, you should wait at least five days until five days have passed since the exposure, at least five days. Getting tested more quickly than that will not be reliable. If you test negative after five days, have not had any symptoms at all, and have not had any ongoing exposure to someone with COVID-19, then your quarantine can end on the eighth day after exposure. So just again, another reminder that we are still in a serious situation in terms of the number of cases that we're experiencing here in the county. It is a race to get people vaccinated, a uh, race with these variants, and we don't want these variants to win. So please stay safe. Uh, even if you've been vaccinated, we need to continue to ask you to wear your mask when you're outside of your home and around 
people that are not from your household. Uh, if we all continue to work together, I firmly believe that we can get ahead of these variants, but this is no time to relax as tempting as it is. We're just not there yet. And with that, I will remind you that our next virtual briefing is Wednesday, April the 24th at 1.30 p.m. and be happy to take questions. Our first reporter will be Chris the Shoemaker from the Intelligencer. Good afternoon. Um, two questions. The first being um, any estimate on how many people were affected by the, the pause on Johnson and Johnson, how many people's appointments had to be rescheduled? We had to reschedule or we canceled 3,977 appointments for yesterday and today across the three vaccine locations that were using Johnson and Johnson. Okay, thank you. And my second um, question is a follow up to the comments you made about um, the hostility at, at some of the vaccine sites. Can you talk at all about what what's leading to that and, and how many inst how many instances of this that you have seen? Well, there's there's been a handful of, of incidents, uh, but one incident is one too many. It's, it's just unacceptable that uh, people are taking frustrations out on our staff. Uh, I can't speak precisely to uh, what has caused frustration, but as I alluded to earlier, I know people are very, very anxious to get vaccinated. Uh, sometimes we uh, there have been occasional problems with uh, that prep mod system. I know we've talked about this at length that have led to some uh, problems with people's appointments at the sites. And I think this is understandably caused some frustration. So I understand that people are frustrated. Uh, I'm just asking that they not take that frustration out on our staff at our vaccination sites. Thank you very much. That's it for me. Next, we'll go to Jim Melward from KYW. Uh, just one quick question. Uh, ASIP is meeting now. Um, what would you look for in this meeting? Uh, I guess so kind of overall broad view. Um, it's really hard for me to comment on that because I'm not sure what data is being presented to them. But I do look forward to their assessment of the data that they have accessible to them and uh, very eager to hear their conclusions about the Johnson and Johnson vaccine and what we might be able to expect in terms of their recommendations for next steps. Next, we'll go to Justine McDaniel from the Philadelphia Inquirer. Good afternoon. Um, a couple of questions. Uh, first one, how does the Johnson & Johnson pause complicate efforts to reach underserved residents, um, transient people, homebound people, etc.? Yeah. Well, the pause will slow down those efforts a bit, um, it, particularly when it comes to individuals experiencing homelessness and individuals that are homebound. We had been Start, we have started to uh, vaccinate individuals that are experiencing homelessness and had a strong preference to use the J&J &J vaccine for that purpose, for the obvious reason that it's just one dose and then that individual's considered fully vaccinated two weeks after receiving that one dose. And similarly for individuals that are homebound, uh, I think, you know, for people to come into someone's home, uh, I think it's better that we can minimize that, uh, particularly given the fact that we are still very much in this pandemic. So uh, it, is, it is going to slow down those efforts uh, without question. Uh, for now, we are able to continue to keep our clinics open by using all of the Pfizer vaccine that we have. Uh, we will be able to do that through next Monday. Uh, by next Tuesday, we will start to come up a bit short. So uh, we're hoping that we'll either get additional Pfizer vaccine or the situation with the Johnson & Johnson will be resolved by next week. Uh, it is also going to delay the opening of another uh, new clinic that we had hoped to open this Friday. We're going to push that to next week and hopefully that won't be delayed any further. 
Okay, great. Thanks for the detail. Um, my second question is just sort of big picture looking at the next few weeks of the rollout. Now that we're in phase 2, um, secretary beam and governor wolf have noted the next challenge may be that we have enough vaccine, but not as much demand as we're trying to reach hesitant folks. Are there any changes you foresee in the rollout? Um, you know, coming up, do you think there's any. Thing you should change about how you're doing it in order to start reaching different people or any new challenges that you foresee coming up? Well, right now we still have a lot of demand, so we'll see how that plays out over these next couple of weeks. But we are continuing all of our educational efforts and we continue to partner with community groups and others on educational town halls uh, in, in multiple languages. And um, we have multiple multiple materials in multiple languages so we can reach people in a way that they're most comfortable. Um, I think education is, is really key here. Uh, we're also continuing to open up more clinics in more places around the county. Uh, we are also increasing our hours. We've started to add some Saturday hours as well as evening hours. You know, in the early days, we were primarily vaccinating people that uh, were more likely to be retired or healthcare workers whose jobs were quite willing and able to let them uh, come during the workday to get vaccinated. But we're moving into a different cohort of individuals now. And so we're trying to make our clinics as flexible and as accessible as we can for those individuals. Thank you. Our next reporter will be Carl Hessler from the Pottstown Mercury. Good afternoon, Commissioner. Um, with the last, last week, you said that you uh, received an influx, extra doses of the J and J vaccine. What happens to the doses that you received? I mean, is there a is there a time limit on when those doses can be administered? Can you keep those in storage for uh, a lengthy period of time until you hear from the feds what what can be done? Yes, we can. So they are safely in storage and uh, we're fine for now on that. Okay. And what about the appointments? Were, were appointments scheduled for the, for the rest of this week and next week for J&J? &J? And are you going to have to cancel those? So we did have J&J &J appointments scheduled for both tomorrow and Friday. We have been able to convert all of those clinics to offer the Pfizer vaccination. And certainly if somebody uh, does not want the Pfizer vaccination, uh, they obviously don't have to accept it. And they can just defer and wait and see until we have more information about J&J. &J. But as of right now, everyone that has an appointment for tomorrow or Friday still has an appointment even if it was for a J&J &J clinic, we have enough Pfizer to convert that over to Pfizer. Okay, and are you still receiving only about 5,850 doses of the Pfizer vaccine a week? That is what we received this week. We did request more for next week uh, because of the uncertainty around the Johnson & Johnson vaccine but we have not yet been told what we can expect to receive for next week. Oh, I assume we'll get you know, that baseline number. That, that 5,800, 5,850 uh, has been promised to us every week, but whether or not we can get anything more than that, we don't have any information on yet. Okay, and one other question on the variants. You said the majority of the variants were the um, UK variant. What were the other variants that have been discovered in the county? You know? I can tell you exactly. Just give me one second here. Uh, we have two that are the B.1.427. Uh, eight that are the B.1.429. Uh, those two are, um, I believe, the South African or Brazilian variants, I believe. And then the B.1.526. We have one case of that, which I believe is the New York variant. Okay. Okay, that's all I had today. Thank you. Next, we'll go to Kelly Rule from Fox 29. Good afternoon. Um, so I know you addressed the appointments for tomorrow and Friday, but for those who already had their appointments canceled yesterday and today, are they given any kind of 
priority in rescheduling. And I only ask this because we are hearing from, from some people that are now unable to get a new appointment for at least two to three weeks. So they have all been contacted and uh, they were immediately offered appointments that were available in our clinics. And so that's really all we can do at this point, uh, not knowing if we're going to get any additional Pfizer vaccine to make up for the Johnson and Johnson, and also not knowing if we can offer Johnson and Johnson. I mean, it is possible that by next week we will be able to offer Johnson and Johnson vaccine again. So uh, right now we, they were offered existing open appointments in our system. And uh, if there are individuals who are not able to get appointments, then we will certainly circle back to them and accommodate them as, as absolutely as quickly as we can. Okay. Um, and just when it comes to the Johnson and Johnson vaccine, I know you touched on this in the beginning, but for people in the county who already received it, or for, for those that, you know, are thinking ahead, and, and I know it's kind of hard to predict what will come out of today, but they're thinking ahead and saying, there's no way I'll get it now. What would you say to them? Well, as always, First, if you have a trusted medical provider, I would talk to them. They're the, the uh, person that knows you the best and can help best assess whether or not there's any issues that you should be concerned about in taking one vaccine over another. Second, I just want to remind everyone that uh, from what we know, and again, I don't have any special knowledge on this, I just know of what the FDA and CDC have released, but the incidence of this very rare side effect is one in a million. And so that risk would have to be balanced against the risk of getting COVID, uh, becoming ill, potentially dying from COVID. So again, this is just a risk assessment that each person has to do, go through for themselves. And then beyond that, I can't really say much. Uh, it will be helpful to hear what the ASEP committee says later today. Hopefully they'll put out some recommendations later today. I, I am certain that they have access to more information than we do publicly. And so I'll look forward to seeing what, what their guidance suggests. Thank you. This concludes our questions for today. Commissioner. Okay, great. Thank you everyone. And we'll see you next week.